Riskin's the co-host of Daily Planet on Discovery Canada, also an evolutionary biologist, and his new book is called Mother Nature Is Trying to Kill You, a lively tour through the dark side of the natural world. And Dan Riskin joins me from New York. Hello. Hello, Rick. How are you? Well, thank you. But, Dan, nature's indeed cruel to the male black widow who, as we know, winds up on this lady loves menu. But it turns out there are worse things. Tell well, me about the plight of the amorous Nephilengus spider. Yeah, I mean, pick your poison, I guess. So, so Nephilengus uh, is a spider that uh, the males are smaller than the females, just like in Black Widows, and they know that they're in for a tough go of it. So as they approach the female, they have to move quickly, and they have to be very, very careful. And if they are lucky enough to get into the position where they can mate with that female before she eats them, what he will do is he'll put his his penis, and actually he has two of them, and they're on the sides of his head, and they're called palps. He'll put them into the female, and then he will rip them off of his body and make a break for it. And they will stay behind, injecting sperm into the female while he tries to get away. Now, he only gets away about one out of every four times. Other, all the other times he'll get eaten. Now, if he gets eaten, that's okay, because she's distracted and his body's still doing what it needs to do in the background. Okay, but if he does manage to get away, then he will defend other males that try to come close to her. He'll fight them off with a vengeance because his genitals are back there doing their job and he doesn't want them interfered with. So this is, this is just a taste of the kinds of things that happen out there that mostly are locked up inside these scientific journals that I've been plowing through and looking for these stories you shouldn't talk about at the dinner table and trying to bring them to light. <laughs> I didn't think it was possible, but your book actually makes it well, makes me feel sorry for the female bed bug and the lowly cockroach. What is it about nature's plan that induces empathy for these pests? Well, the empathy thing is that's all human, right? I mean, I don't know whether animals have empathy or not, but to tell the stories and to really take a close look at what happens to them, you, you get a different perspective. So the cockroach, I'm absolutely with you. I mean, nobody loves cockroaches. Maybe some people do, but um, I don't love them. But what, there's something called an emerald cockroach wasp, and it will catch a cockroach. It will sting it so that it it's, it's not paralyzed, but it loses the will to walk. And then she will drag it underground to her lair. She'll lay an egg on it, and then she'll bury it alive and leave. And then this cockroach will sit there defenselessly while the egg hatches into a maggot. The maggot will crawl into the cockroach. And then this maggot will eat the internal organs in the best possible order to keep the cockroach alive as long as possible, all the while spitting out saliva that has antimicrobial bacterial, antibacterial stuff in it. So so that the, the cockroach doesn't start rotting. So this, this maggot will eat for weeks until it grows big enough and healthy enough that it can emerge as an adult wasp and then fly away, leaving the corpse of this cockroach behind. So this, this species of wasp can't reproduce without torturing a cockroach. And there are hundreds of thousands of species of insects that do this. They're called the parasitoids. And, and, and it just sort of gives you this, this wake-up call that there isn't this gentle, lovely nature that's always just trying to be as, as uh, gentle as it can. That there are, are animals out there that have to hurt each other in order to survive. And that's just the way things are. And if you feel sympathy for the cockroach, I think that says a lot about who we are and how we're, we're maybe a little bit different from what goes on out there. Dan, if procreation is what we're all here to do, why does nature bother making it so dangerous for so many species to get a leg over? Yeah, it's it's this wonderful thing. You know, we're, we evolved, and, and in the game of evolution, the, the whole point of the game is to get your DNA into the next generation. And by that, I mean your DNA, not your species DNA, not your cousin, you. You want your DNA copied. And so um, animals will make the kinds of sacrifices we're talking about so that they can get their own DNA passed on. And when you look at humans, we make sacrifices too. I came across an article just this morning that showed that um, when when people have a child in the home, one or more children, and they take a standardized uh, happiness test where they, they fill out all these questions about how happy they are, people with a child are less happy than people who don't have a child. It's equivalent to about a 5% decrease in income and the amount of you know, less happy you would be if you had that happen to you. And yet, having a kid is uh, something that people choose to do or sometimes happens by accident. And it's, it's a wonderful part of life. And we make these sacrifices for that. Um, having a child is built into our DNA. It's not really about our own personal happiness. It's about what our genes are telling us to do. And in fact, there are data from 18th and 19th century Korea that show that if a man has his uh, his testes cut off before puberty, if he's castrated, he will live on average 15 to 19 years longer than an intact male. 
but I challenge you to find somebody who would sign up for that. And so these are the kinds of trade-offs that we face where we don't get to live as long as possible. We have to pay a cost to pass on our DNA, but that's what it's all about. So do you reckon we have free will or are we just prisoners of our DNA? Well, you know, it's a big discussion, but my honest feeling about the whole thing is that we are prisoners of our DNA, but we have these huge brains that we built and we can do things with them that our DNA didn't have in mind. And it's okay for us to do things that our DNA didn't intend for us to do. So for example, if you look through the animal world, there are no human rights, right? There's no you know, there's no bill of rights for a seal before it gets killed by a, by a killer whale about how it's going to be treated and what, whether that's going to be an ethical death. That's not, that doesn't happen, you know, and, and animals will, will screw each other over at left, right, and center. But humans have come up with this idea of human rights or gender equality. And those are things that don't exist in nature, but are very, very good. And that we should do, even though they're not natural. So I, I, you know, cause the thing that gets me is everybody's always saying, act natural, eat natural foods, do natural exercises paleo this and the the point is that nature is not this ideal that we should be holding ourselves to because if you start looking around in nature you can justify any terrible thing you want it's awful out there you are by training and inclination a bat guy right but it turned you for a brief moment into a bot guy the host of a notorious parasite you even named how did that happen yeah well so i mean i I keep telling people if you're going to get a human parasite you should definitely get a bot fly it's basically you get stung by a mosquito or bitten by a mosquito when you're in the tropics i was in belize and you don't know it but the mosquito drops off an egg from a a bot fly that has earlier tackled the mosquito and pinned this thing to its belly and so when the mosquito bites you it drops off this egg and then it goes into your flesh and it starts eating your flesh and so i being a biologist knew about these things and as soon as i had a mosquito bite that started growing i was like ah, i'm i'm all over this i'm taking this to the hospital i'm getting this thing out but other people like it grows for six weeks and comes out as this inch long maggot that they totally Mm. didn't expect to see coming but the nice thing is it stays in one place it doesn't spread to your liver once it's out it's out so if you're going to get a parasite that's the one you want to get i had a wonderful experience just having that parasite was scary and terrible and hurt but it was like I was at one with nature, you know what I mean? It seems Mother Nature wants to colonize us, and we just keep procreating and giving it the chance. How often are people the target of nature's murderous plan? People are much less the target of nature's murderous plan than they were before antibiotics and modern medicine. That's Things are going really well, especially in the Western world right now. It's still rough in a lot of other parts of the world. But, you know, it, it's gotten to the point where, you know, in Canada, we can sort of forget that Mother Nature is really that rough and sort of tell ourselves that a visit to the produce section at Safeway is actually what it's like to go looking for food in nature. Sheep. Sheep turn out to be more cunning than I'd expected in your book, and in our rush to make them seem like humans, uh, it flies against what we might have thought. As you point out, wolves scare sheep. They all run away. That's what I thought. But what's really going on there? Sheep are far darker than we give them credit for. (laughs) I mean, so uh, when you take sheep and you put GPS collars on them so you can track their movements relative to one another and you have a herding dog approach them, which is functionally the same as a predator, they don't just all run away and end up in the same place. They end up in the same place because every single sheep is trying to put itself between... They're trying to put another sheep between them and the predator. So it's that old joke. I have a friend who he carries bear spray when he goes hiking and he says, it's not for the bear. It's so that if a bear approaches, I can spray my friend in the face, kick his leg and then make a break for it. Because the bear, I don't have to outrun a bear. I just have to outrun the other person the bear's chasing. So for sheep, it's the same game, right? If they can find another sheep for the bear to eat, then they're going to live. And so all of these sheep are just, they're all trying to get into the middle of this huddle because they're trying to make sure somebody else gets eaten. Stay with the black sheep for a moment, because this I thought was really intriguing. How is it that the offspring of a ewe that, that ate something called a corn lily during pregnancy might not even see a wolf coming? What is this strange story of sheep yeah. and the corn lily? If a sheep happens to eat this one plant uh, on the 14th day of pregnancy, it blocks one gene from doing its job on that day. And so if it eats the plant on the 12th day, no problem. If it eats it on the 16th day, no problem. But on the 14th day, the fetal development is at a stage where the brain, the part of the brain that's going to make eyeballs, splits into left and right halves. And it blocks that gene from working. And so what ends up happening is... The, the sheep never gets two eyes. It only has one eye. And what happens is a couple months later, uh, a mutant cyclops sheep baby is born. And it only happens because of this one plant. And so farmers that, that have sheep in areas where this plant grows, they know that it, you know, they, ha- they know exactly when their sheep are mating and when they're reproducing and all that stuff. So what they do is they make sure that the sheep are on the move on the 14th day so that they don't eat anything. They don't have a chance to eat too much of this plant. 
I think it's remarkable how often we see like a third actor, the lily in this case, interfering to ensure its own survival between two other species. And I wanted to, to talk to you about the role of parasites with respect to that. I recall, though, for the longest time, there was always this folk myth about pregnant women should never handle kitty litter because of the dangers of contracting toxoplasma. Remind yes. us what that is. Yeah, you, and it's not a myth. It, it, toxoplasma is a parasite that goes between cats and rats. And so in their natural life cycle, the cat poops, the rat accidentally eats the poop, and then when a cat eats the infected rat, it goes back into a cat. And so it goes from cat to rat like this in a cycle. And... Um, it's actually a disease that cats that, you know, especially if your cat goes outside, it's a, your cat in Canada can get this disease. And um, if if a human gets it, it doesn't do much. But if a pregnant woman gets this parasite, it can it can have really harmful effects on the baby. And so changing kitty litter is a time when you might accidentally get, you know, some poop in your mouth somehow. Goodness knows how, but it could happen, and the likelihood is decreased by saying that women who are pregnant shouldn't change the kitty litter. But what's really cool is that to get into a cat, um, this parasite manipulates the rats. And what it does is it rewires the brain of the rat because a rat instinctively is scared of cats. And part of that is that a rat instinctively, if it smells cat urine, its brain is pre-wired to be terrified. And so if you take a rat raised in captivity and it smells cat urine, it'll be very scared and it'll run away. But if it has this parasite, the parasite rewires the brain. So when it smells cat urine, it becomes sexually aroused. And if there's, you know, if you're sexually aroused, you're less likely to run away. You're probably going to stick around because you're having a nice time. And so this rat um, ends up getting eaten more quickly. And so because this parasite has the ability to manipulate a brain, the fact that it does get into people raises a lot of questions. So people can get this parasite. In fact, the, the estimate I've seen is that within Canada, about a third of people have this parasite in their bodies. And if you have this parasite, it rewires your brain in very subtle ways. For one thing, it slows down your reaction time, and that means you're more likely to die in a traffic accident. For another thing, if you're a woman, it makes you more kind and loving and gentle. If you're but subtle, but enough that on a standardized personality test, it does come out as a significant difference. For males, um, it tends to make them more jealous. And for both sexes, it makes us more or less likely to try new things. And so this parasite is affecting a third of Canadians and their personalities. And what's really cool is if people look across cultures, if you look at Brazil, where 70% of people have this parasite, you might say that kind-hearted women and jealous men is kind of characteristic of Brazil compared to, say, South Korea, where only 5% of people have this parasite. So are cultural differences being driven by these parasites? This isn't just mice on an island. This isn't just sheep, man. This is what we live. And there's a whole world of this stuff that's being uncovered by scientists all the time, and I just think it's the neatest stuff in the world. And might that account for why people love cats? Can the parasite alter that behavior, or is that still the province of advertising? Ah, uh, that is, that's the kind of question that, that you find yourself asking when you look at this stuff. I mean, why do we have cats around in the first place? So that they'll ignore us when we try to feed them? I mean, <laughs> cats are jerks when you look at it, and but they're cute. But And yet, you know, this parasite has done a great job of you know, finding its way into cats and rats and cats have spread all over the world. So the parasite has too. And you wonder whether we're getting played even more than we realize. But those are questions that haven't been answered yet. Speaking of Brazil, there is the skipper caterpillar of Brazil that engages in an amazing feat of fecal flinging. What's up with that? What is up with that? So there is a, uh, this caterpillar that lives in Brazil has to worry about a, uh, a wasp that is going to try to lay eggs on it and then the eggs will burrow into its body and it will eat its internal organs. It's a terrible way to die and this, this caterpillar doesn't want that to happen. And the way that this wasp would find it is by smelling its poop. So the caterpillar has an incentive to not poop anywhere near where it is. And so its solution to this problem is to fling its poop as far as it can every time it poops. But uh, the biomechanics of how it does so have been extensively studied. To put this in human terms, uh, imagine a, uh, a five foot tall woman flinging her poop 75 feet. That's the kind of distance we're talking about from a lying down on her belly position, by the way. So that's that's what we're talking about. This thing goes flying at like, um, you know, more than a meter a second when it comes flying out. And so... Um, it, it works. And, and all of this, all the biomechanics, it's not just, people thought that it was sort of like a, 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 there's something called an anal comb. And they thought that, you know, when you take your tooth, 
toothbrush and you rub the bristles, you can get toothpaste all over your mirror. They thought that was the mechanism by which it did this, but it turns out it's not. It's actually a buildup of pressure, just like a spitball through a straw. And so, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing I, I keep arguing that people are missing out on the best parts of nature because they keep looking for these cute stories of animals cooperating and cuddling and panda bears and la di da da But it's when you look at that dark side that you find a caterpillar that can launch its poop that fast. And that's cool. Like that's for me as a scientist, that's the stuff that I think is the most interesting. And so that's where I went with this book. And I, it was a lot of fun. The paradoxes of nature leap out of your book. And, and riddle me this. If, if, Procreation is merely about males passing on their DNA. How to explain the all-female species of salamander that self-inseminates to produce its own clones? No need for the attention of Mr. Salamander, yet it'll mate with male salamanders of other salamander species. I won't be using the word salamander again this year, but surely this makes no sense in nature. It's it's confusing out there. So, you know, one of the, one of the uh, sort of straw man hype things that I take a swing at is people that say that relationships, you know, are there, there are natural ways to behave. And you get this a lot with marriage equality debates, right? People that say, well, it takes a man and a woman to make a baby. And then you have people on the other side that say, well, you know, you have same-sex couples that show up in all kinds of species, rabbits, bats, penguins. So it's natural. So it's okay. And my argument is, doesn't matter what nature does. Don't go there because you have these salamanders where um, the females have figured out how to pass on, how to, how to lay an egg that is already, um, that is a clone of her and she doesn't have to mate to do it and she doesn't need a male. And so these females can just pass on their genes every time. But the, the problem is that there's a, a biochemical step that she can't skip where she has to have the chemicals in sperm in order to do this, but she doesn't need the actual genetic information in the sperm. So what this means is males that mate with her don't get any genetic benefit as a result of this. And what's happened over evolutionary time is that there are no males. So there are only females and there are no males to mate with. So this female has to go out and find males of other species of salamander and convince them to mate with her, which they do. I don't know. Maybe it's fun for salamanders. I don't know exactly what turns salamanders on or how they, you know, what they're thinking when they're doing this kind of thing. But um, <laughs> they don't get anything genetically out of it. They mate with this other salamander of another species, and then they go back to mating with their own species if they want to have babies. So um, I was going to say, why, why is sex better than cloning anyway? I think I know the answer but you're a guest here. I mean, sex, after all, only gives you 50%, uh, the offspring, 50% of your DNA, not 100. And that's kind of imperfect. Huh? Well, the thing about sex that makes it so interesting, besides the obvious, is that when you when you are trying to mate with another member of the species, you need to pick somebody who has good genes because your baby is going to be half you, which is great, but then its survival is going to depend on how good a mate you found to make a baby with. And so in terms of evolutionary pressures and what's important in an animal's life, finding a good mate is just as important as survival itself. Because if you, if the best you can do is a really crappy mate, your, your DNA is not going to go anywhere. It's not going to, it's not, it'll die in the next generation. So all of a sudden looking around to see who's around you. And if you find them attractive, which is a measure of how good their DNA is, those things are just as important to an animal as survival itself. And if you think about where we allocate our energy when we're, you know, teenagers, um, it, this is all we think about, right? And th it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective that we put that much effort into finding a good partner. It was a total game changer. Before sex, and there was a time before sex evolved, you just passed on whatever DNA you happened to have. But once sex existed, you had to be checking everybody out and you had to be showing off. And so that just made the world way more interesting. Let me close on this. You say one of the things you were trying to figure out in this book was how your relationship with your young son fit in, fits in nature, if love is real or just self-preservation. What's your conclusion, or is it still a work in progress? It was interesting for me to be writing about all these animals and their reproductive, you know, the fact that they're they're just trying to pass on their DNA. Oh, this is so obvious because they're trying to just pass on their DNA. And then I would look at the way I behaved with my son, and I, I could see it right in front of me. I'm just trying to protect my own DNA. I'm trying to make sure that he has a good chance of survival. Of course, I care about him more than anything in the world. I'm supposed to as a species. And to me, when I first started thinking about it, that took some of the beauty away from it because I felt like a robot that was just doing what it was programmed to do by its DNA. But um, as I wrote the book and as I made progress through there, it, it, it sort of, it, it became 
more a story about where my love came from, not an invalidation of it. And so, you know, when you think about the fact that um, when humans realized that we weren't at the center of the universe, it was a bit of a blow because we kind of liked that story. And I kind of like the story that we just love our kids because it's magical. But when you understand that we're on a rock floating through space and that it's it's way more complicated than just being at the center of the universe, it adds a lot. You get something from that. You get an understanding that wasn't the story you'd wanted, but is even more interesting. And when it comes to my love for my son, understanding the evolutionary origins of the love I have for my son gives it a context that it didn't have before and I think makes it even more beautiful things are. And if you feel sympathy for the cockroach, I think that says a lot about who we are and how we're, we're maybe a little bit different from what goes on out there. Dan, if procreation is what we're all here to do, why does nature bother making it so dangerous for so many species to get a leg over? Yeah, it's it's this wonderful thing. You know, we're, we evolved and, and in the game of evolution, the, the whole point of the game is to get your DNA into the next generation. And by that, I mean your DNA, not your species DNA, not your cousin, you. You want your DNA copied. And so um, animals will make the kinds of sacrifices we're talking about so that they can get their own DNA passed on. And when you look at humans, we make sacrifices too. I came across an article just this morning that showed that um, when when people have a child in the home, one or more children, and they take a standardized uh, happiness test where they, they fill out all these questions about how happy they are, people with a child are less happy than people who don't have a child. It's equivalent to about a 5% decrease in income and the amount of you know, less happy you would be if you had that happen to you. And yet, having a kid is uh, something that people choose to do or sometimes happens by accident. And it's it's a wonderful part of life. And we make these sacrifices for that. Um, having a child is built into our DNA. It's not really about our own personal happiness. It's about what our genes are telling us to do. And in fact, there are data from 18th and 19th century Korea that show that if a man has his uh, his testes cut off before puberty, if he's castrated, he will live on average 15 to 19 years longer than an intact male. But I challenge you to find somebody who would sign up for that. And so these are the kinds of trade-offs that would pin this thing to its belly. And so when the mosquito bites you, it drops off this egg and then it goes into your flesh and it starts eating your flesh. And so I being a biologist, knew about these things. And as soon as I had a mosquito bite that started growing, I was like, ah, I'm, I'm all over this. I'm taking this to the hospital. I'm getting this thing out. But other people, like it grows for six weeks and comes out as this inch long maggot that they totally mm. didn't expect to see coming. But the nice thing is it stays in one place. It doesn't spread to your liver. Once it's out, it's out. So if you're going to get a parasite, that's the one you want to get. I had right. a wonderful experience. Just having that parasite was scary and terrible and hurt. But it was like I was at one with nature, you know what I mean? It seems Mother Nature wants to colonize us, and we just keep procreating and giving it the chance. How often are people the target of nature's murderous plan? People are much less the target of nature's murderous plan than they were before antibiotics and modern medicine. That's Things are going really well, especially in the Western world right now. It's still rough in a lot of other parts of the world. But, you know, it, it's gotten to the point where, you know, in Canada, we can sort of forget that Mother Nature is really that rough and sort of tell ourselves that a visit to the produce section at Safeway is actually what it's like to go looking for food in nature. Sheep. Sheep turn out to be more cunning than I'd expected in your book, and in our rush to make them seem like humans, uh, it flies against what we might have thought. As you point out, wolves scare sheep. They all run away. That's what I thought. But what's really going on there? Sheep are far darker than we give them credit for. <laughs> I mean, so uh, when you take sheep and you put GPS collars on them so you can track their movements relative to one another and you have a herding dog approach them, which is functionally the same as a predator, they don't just all run away and end up in the same place. They end up in the same place because every single sheep is... I didn't think it was possible, but your book actually makes it... Well, makes me feel sorry for the female bed bug and the lowly cockroach. What is it about nature's plan that induces empathy for these pests? Well, the empathy thing is that's all human, right? I mean, I don't know whether animals have empathy or not, but to tell the stories and to really take a close look at what happens to them, you, you get a different perspective. So the cockroach, I'm absolutely with you. I mean, nobody loves cockroaches. Maybe some people do, but um, I don't love them. But what, there's something called an emerald cockroach wasp, and it will catch a cockroach. It will sting it so that it 
it's it's not paralyzed, but it loses the will to walk. And then she will drag it underground to her lair. She'll lay an egg on it, and then she'll bury it alive and leave. And then this cockroach will sit there defenselessly while the egg hatches into a maggot. The maggot will crawl into the cockroach. And then this maggot will eat the internal organs in the best possible order to keep the cockroach alive as long as possible, all the while spitting out saliva that has antimicrobial bacterial, antibacterial stuff in it so that the, the cockroach doesn't start rotting. So this, this maggot will eat for weeks until it grows big enough and healthy enough that it can emerge as an adult wasp and then fly away, leaving the corpse of this cockroach behind. So this, this species of wasp can't reproduce without torturing a cockroach. And there are hundreds of thousands of species of insects that do this. They're called the parasitoids. And, and, and it just sort of gives you this, this wake-up call that there isn't this gentle, lovely nature that's always just trying to be as, as uh, gentle as it can, that there are, are animals out there that have to hurt each other in order to survive. And that's just the way we face, where we don't get to live as long as possible. We have to pay a cost to pass on our DNA, but that's what it's all about. So and do thinking, you reckon we have free will, or are we just prisoners of our DNA? Well... You know, it, it, it's a big discussion, but my honest feeling about the whole thing is that we are prisoners of our DNA, but we have these huge brains that we built, and we can do things with them that our DNA didn't have in mind, and it's okay for us to do things that our DNA didn't intend for us to do. So, for example, if you look through the animal world, there are no human rights, right? There's no... You know, there's no Bill of Rights for a seal before it gets killed by a, by a killer whale about how it's going to be treated and what, whether that's going to be an ethical death. That's not, that doesn't happen. You know, and, and animals will, will screw each other over at left, right, and center. But humans have come up with this idea of human rights or gender equality. And those are things that don't exist in nature but are very, very good and that we should do even though they're not natural. So, I, I you know, because the thing that gets me is everybody's always saying, act natural, eat natural foods, do natural exercises paleo this and the, the point is that nature is not this ideal that we should be holding ourselves to because if you start looking around in nature you can justify any terrible thing you want it's awful out there you are by training and inclination a bat guy right but it turned you for a brief moment into a bot guy the host of a notorious parasite you even named how did that happen yeah well so i mean i, I keep telling people if you're going to get a human parasite you should definitely get a bot fly it's it, basically you get stung by a mosquito while, or bitten by a mosquito when you're in the tropics i was in belize and you don't know it but the mosquito drops off an egg from a, a bot fly that has earlier tackled the mosquito and Riskin's the co-host of daily planet on discovery canada also an evolutionary biologist and his new book is called Mother Nature is trying to kill you. A lively tour through the dark side of the natural world. And Dan Riskin joins me from New York. Hello. Hello, Rick. How are you? Well, thank you. But, Dan, nature's indeed cruel to the male black widow, who, as we know, winds up on this lady loves menu. But it turns out there are worse things. Tell well, me about the plight of the amorous Nephilengus spider. Yeah, I mean, pick your poison, I guess. So, so Nephilengus uh, is a spider that uh, the males are smaller than the females, just like in Black Widows, and they know that they're in for a tough go of it. So as they approach the female, they have to move quickly, and they have to be very, very careful. And if they are lucky enough to get into the position where they can mate with that female before she eats them, what he will do is he'll put his his penis, and actually he has two of them, and they're on the sides of his head, and they're called palps. He'll put them into the female, and then he will rip them off of his body and make a break for it. And they will stay behind, injecting sperm into the female while he tries to get away. Now, he only gets away about one out of every four times. Other, all the other times he'll get eaten. Now, if he gets eaten, that's okay, because she's distracted and his body's still doing what it needs to do in the background. Okay, but if he does manage to get away, then he will defend other males that try to come close to her. He'll fight them off with a vengeance because his genitals are back there doing their job and he doesn't want them interfered with. So this is, this is just a taste of the kinds of things that happen out there that mostly are locked up inside these scientific journals that I've been plowing through and looking for these stories you shouldn't talk about at the dinner table and trying to bring them to light. 